I don't like painting from photographs because uh, it seems to me that's got nothing to do with art, although there's many will disagree. And it's about trying to figure out how on earth does all this work? How on earth can I give some sense of the feeling of the whole thing? And not just a one-point viewpoint photograph, which would be it's a different thing in its own right. So it's the third session, and um, had one couple of hours a few days ago. It's getting the same light, of course. This time of year it's wonderful because it rakes across at this time of the day. <laughs> Jolly nippy, but um, then I had one more session, and then I'm trying now just to get some of the sparkle. It's very tricky to keep it open and give some sense of space within these trees, not to have them too flat. So I'm just going to work into the trees a little bit just to further darken the tone of that tree in the foreground. Problem is, having worked on it, the weather been pretty poor for the last five or six days, so the paintings dried. I prefer to work with them sort of wet into wet like this as, this, as the next layer of paint obviously melds with the previous one better. So it's very difficult not to get it too jumpy. get the tones to, to be consistent. So no, no good fiddling about though. Just gonna have to take a chance and do what I can to capture some of this light today. Some painters don't want to paint outdoors. They want to, Bonnard wouldn't paint on the spot because he said, even he wouldn't work from still life because he said there was too much information and he felt inadequate in the face of weak, is the word he used, in the face of it. I'm, I find that the more information, the better, then I might get some of it. But it is a different experience, very different from working from, uh, from drawings, uh, which I have done in the studio from drawings on the spot, which is uh, another way of working, but it, it, it gives a a different quality but uh, I use the wrong end of the brush quite often at this stage because it stops things getting too uh, dense, keeps the paint open a bit. Scrappy little brushes but brushes are brushes that you, you like them in certain states sometimes. Right, I'm going to go for this tree try and bring some of these branches through uh, there. Ah, tremendously difficult with this wind. The term picture making was almost a term of abuse really uh, and certainly illustration was used very pejoratively. Now that's rather unfair on you know, the wonderful draftsmanship of fine illustrators. It's not really that that we're talking about. It's it's the, the way of approaching something which uses tricks and shortcuts, which shorthand, which are very pleasing in terms of effects, but are actually quite a reduction of the marvellous nature of what's in front of you. It's, uh, it's more about clever ideas on the part of the illustrator and his style and techniques and so on and new takes on something than, than actually finding something out, investigating and finding something out that's unique about this particular day, this particular experience. It's not the brief of an illustrator. They do something else that, that can be wonderful. But it's not about painting. Painting seems to me to be about 
trying to find a way with this pathetic palette of paints, pigments, however good, to capture some of the magnificence of this nature, of the sparkle of the light, of the tremendous movement, and, and all on a flat surface. I mean, it's an impossible task. We keep the painters trying to do it forever. And one is always aware, in a way, that the paint, you'd just destroy the painters all the time if you thought they were, if you went on the criterion that this is just a reduction of what's in front of me. But, and some people do. Giacometti just const constantly was aware of how he was just nowhere near what he was looking at, and the dealers would whisk stuff away from him in the end. So all he was interested in was the process as much as anything, or rather cannily said so, although I think he enjoyed some of the money from the paintings nonetheless. Perhaps we'd need some really nice dark, there's a wonderful dark shadow there. Because we, because the other thing is that, you know, just simple things like, if you haven't got it dark enough, it's more important to concentrate on the dark areas of the painting in order to paint light than, than trying to get lots of bright light colour because you will just reduce the light that way. So you need to set the agenda. That means get your darks dark enough. Daylight is merciless, actually. So never be too alarmed at the way pictures look. Painting is about what you can't do. Was we're trying to um, not exactly work out why we can't do it, but it is about going further than what you can already do. It's an act of faith. You just hope for the best of some of it. It's almost in a, in a sense better when you get find yourself in a mess. Very alarming sometimes, but then eventually the whole process of getting out of that mess sort of takes you somewhere else that you thought of. So it's not about doing what you can already do. How did you get started? Well, well, I, I uh, had always had some kind of interest uh, in my early teens. Um, I. Uh, got an idea that I wanted to draw and sketch, as it would be called. And um, I must have bought a sketchbook, and often when I was off on a little trip somewhere, I'd make a little pencil drawings, and um, usually sort of churches and steeples. And I can remember sitting in a cafe in York once with my parents having sort of tea. Never did anything about it, and I was at a very, very academic school, so. Um, where you didn't do art unless you were a kind of academically um, weak, which is a very strange idea that if you're thick you do music. We, our options were music, woodwork, art or Latin. So I took the Latin, being quite academically gifted and so on. And did, did. However, when I was 16, it was a change of art master, a young art master came and um, I jumped at the opportunity, joined the art club, and then I must have caught his eye and um, somehow inveigled my way into doing um, A-level art with architecture as an end in view, as a so-called long shot, well it was a long shot, applied to the Slade. And I was accepted there. And so that, in the end, that squashed any ideas that it was a bad idea for me to be, a, be an artist or a painter. And so I went straight to, straight to the slate from school direct. There was um, much happening in the art world. It was the time of the pop art movement, um, American abstract expressionism. Um, and there was all that the, the, this was what was in the air very much. The people who were making a noise at the Slade were the people who were 
pop artists and abstract expressionists. They were not people who were interested in painting the world around them in the sense that I had thought artists did when I left the north of England. So I started to try and paint in these ways and I found it exciting um, and quite, quite successful. I won a prize at the Slade for summer composition which was a semi-abstract painting. Frank Auerbach saw it and, and was reported to have said it must have been one of the best paintings done in the last ten years at the Slade because it had involved so much decision making through the course of it. However, a group of painters came from Liverpool who were aggressive figurative painters. My natural bent was, I think, towards figurative work. And it's gone on from there, really. It must have been about this time you met William Coldstream. <coughs> he didn't teach at all, but he was marvellous in his crits that he used to give. Um, and um, I used to think he was particularly marvellous because he kept giving me prizes. But apart from that, I got to know Ewan Uglow quite well. And what Ewan Uglow, who also was a very painstaking painter, and Frank Auerbach had in common, was a very rigorous approach to their work. Set a very, very rigorous and high standard that one, one feels is... Um, something that one is constantly working towards or is perhaps one does it in one's own way but it is um, they've certainly set the agenda that's the sort of current expression you would use. Apart from the tutors who were the influences on you? Well certainly fellow students some fellow students I've mentioned already the group from Liverpool Mike Knowles and Pete Sainty a sculptor um, but also John Arnold, who came from uh, um, Norfolk. All very serious painters. He was, he was a, a very fine painter, still is. Um, Peter Prendergast was another. So we, we, we formed a kind of group, and it was strength in numbers, I think, with a positive, strong approach to figuration, not as a as a retreat back into the life room because we couldn't do abstract expression in a pop art or whatever was the current trend but we we felt positively as a group that this was that we were part of the whole mainstream main movement of painting that had been going on that had European Western European painting I guess since the Renaissance I mean that's how we grandly saw it of course, making pictures isn't just about illustration, is it? There's far more to ma making pictures than that. Um, picture making, which is uh, another way, of, the other way round, was actually something which um, was sneered at at the Slade. Oh, he's just a picture maker, rather than a painter who was making, trying to make something new. Um, and it was particularly a. a um, could be directed at, at, at the figurative painters because we would just make nice pretty pictures according to the cutting edge abstract expressionists who could more easily say that their picture was an autonomous or art object or the pop artists. Um, since Cezanne this idea that, that it was Cezanne who gave us the idea that the picture existed in its own right as an autonomous autonomous object. It's actually always been true, but um, that's been the, the jargon in art historical terms today is that it began with Cezanne. Um, and that painters are able to remove themselves from nature altogether, if they wish. And with no reference to external reality, the painting is an autonomous object of shapes, colours, whatever. So painting is about making something new, an autonomous object. Uh, and it's often confused that because you're a figurative painter, you're copying. We're not copying. There's a dreadful word used today of, that we are mimetic, meaning that somehow we're mimicking and miming what's out there. We're not copying. We are looking, trying to understand, and then respond and make marks in the terms of colour, paint, colour, shape, form, on a flat surface, 
that's, that says something exciting, hopefully, about the world we inhabit. But it is not the world we inhabit, that is there. So a painting is an analogy. Um, it's, it's, um, it's an equivalent. It's not a copy. An illustrator would tend perhaps to copy or invent in a sort of well-worn way, or use technique. It won't discover necessarily anything new. I mean, ideally, one, in, in painting, one is trying to find something new, and the idea is that um, we don't do what we can already do. You start off a painting, you move into it, and after a short while, you always start because you know what you're doing. But then there's part of you that can paint a lot better than you can paint yourself, the conscious part. So you've got to somehow just paint and let go and let the part of you that paints really well have a go. Now it's, that's usually, it either happens because you get in such an awful mess with, the, with what you can already do, or um, you just get so involved, that's called concentration, I guess. It's not thinking about it, but it's concentrating. The same way as you don't think when you're driving, but you have to concentrate. So you, you concentrate, and there's part of your brain which is perfectly capable of painting really well if you let it. 